As I was thinking about what I might share with you tonight, uh, maybe, maybe a little more personal and at the same time biblical as we stand on the edge of a brand new year. This is a time when people uh, may typically rethink how they view life, uh, reestablish some uh, priorities, hit the reset button, uh, hit the delete button and uh, try to start all over again. Perspective is really important and even self-speak as it's often called today. What you say to yourself about yourself and about your own life is very, very important. There are people now who are uh, no doubt mulling over the ambitions that they have for the coming year, the achievements that they would like to accomplish in the coming year, the direction they would like to see their life take. But before you ever get to those kinds of things, there are some other things that you need to think about in terms of creating a structure and a paradigm for how you live your life as a Christian. And to take a look at those, I want you to uh, go in the New Testament to the first epistle written by Peter. First Peter is an eminently practical book, and uh, it, it shouldn't be too long uh, in your life that goes by when you don't reconnect with First Peter in particular. It is a very dynamic book. It, it is dynamic in the sense that it speaks to life in a powerful way. And it is true that uh, as you think, so you are, and thinking appropriately about yourself as a Christian is essential if you're going to be what God wants you to be. You, you need to sort of hit the reset button and reaffirm what it is that you're committed to as you move ahead. Some essential divine realities that form the structure of your own perspective on yourself as you look at yourself. Well, we're not talking about looking at um, something outside yourself, something beyond yourself, successes, achievements, accomplishments. We're talking about how you view yourself, how you look at your own life. And let me just uh, say that there are a few things that Peter tells us that that set really an incomparable structure for how to view your life as you move forward. And I'm going to give you as many of them as, uh, as we can do in the next 40 minutes or so, and we'll edit as we go. Uh, these are things that um, have been a part of my thinking for many, many years and many, many decades, way back years and years ago, decades ago when I first went through First Peter. I was discovering these kinds of things that establish the grid of a paradigm for the life of a Christian, and I want you to look at them. Many of them will be very familiar to you. Uh, you might want to jot them down as we go. You'll find them, I think, very helpful and very practical. Number one, and here's what I, what I think is the beginning point uh, of, a, of an appropriate view of oneself as a Christian, remember who owns you. Remember who owns you. Remember who owns you. You will notice in chapter 1 of 1 Peter verse 18, you were not redeemed or purchased or bought with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers, but with precious blood as of a lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. Then verse 21, through Him you have become believers in God. What that's telling us is that God owns us because He purchased us. Acts chapter 20 verse 28 says that God bought us with His own blood. Chapter. 2 of First Peter, verse 9, since you have been purchased by God, you are a chosen race, Christians collectively, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, and then this, a people for God's own possession. We have been talking through the last few years about the fact that Christians are slaves owned by God. God. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20 says, you're not your own, you're bought with a price. You're not your own, you're bought with a price. We know from the New Testament that you were chosen before the foundation of the world. Your names were written in the Lamb's book of life. You were chosen to be given to Christ as a part of His bride. In time, 
the Holy Spirit convicted you, you were brought to salvation, and you came to be the possession of Christ. John 6 says, you were given to Him by God the Father. He paid the price, His blood, so that God could take you, own you, and then give you to Christ as a gift of His love. I think this is at the foundation of how a Christian views his life. You're not your own. You are bought with a price. You are not your own. And at all junctures, you have to constantly remind yourself, I'm not my own. I'm not the master of my own fate. I'm not the captain of my own destiny. I'm not in charge of my own life. I belong to God. Yes, there is a giving up of prerogatives. There's a giving up of personal ambitions. But at the same time, there's the promise of God that He knows best and will empower you to be everything that He wants you to be, which is far more than you would ever be on your own. Everything starts with remembering who owns you, who bought you at an immense price, the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, the purchase price. The picture here is a picture of a slave being bought with an extreme price, not silver, not gold, but blood, not just anyone's blood, but the blood of the sinless Son of God. So that's where it starts. Let me give you a second one that's related to this. This too is part of the perspective grid that every Christian needs to have. It is this, remember who owns you. Secondly, renew your oath of obedience. Renew your oath of obedience. As you go into this year, you have to renew the commitment to be obedient. You say, now wait a minute, well, where does that commitment come in? Let's go back to 1 Peter chapter 1 and see what Peter says about this, and it's very, very interesting. Peter is an apostle of Jesus Christ, verse 1. He's writing to uh, uh, believers who reside as aliens uh, in the world, as we are all aliens scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia. They are chosen. They're the elect chosen by God according to His predetermined knowledge. Then He says this, they are elect according to the foreknowledge of God by the sanctifying work of the Spirit to obey Jesus Christ. That's the whole point of your salvation is to bring you into obedience to Christ. This is not a burdensome obedience. This is a joyful obedience because obedience produces what? blessing. Obedience produces blessing in this life, grace upon grace, and it, re it also produces reward, eternal reward in the life to come. But you may not have realized that when you came to Christ and you confessed your sin and your sinfulness and you asked Him to save you from your sins and to become your Lord and Savior, inherent in that was an oath of obedience. You were saying, I confess Jesus as my Lord. What that means is if He's your Lord, you're His slave. There was inherent in that confession an oath of obedience. And then in a most interesting statement in verse 2, Peter says this, to obey Jesus Christ and be sprinkled with His blood. Well, what does that mean? That's not talking about salvation uh, as regards His death on the cross. There, there's nothing about being sprinkled with the blood of Christ in any of the epistles of the New Testament. So what in the world is Peter referring to? What do you mean, obey Jesus Christ and be sprinkled with His blood? Well, Peter is an Old Testament scholar. He knows his Old Testament, and I'll show you where he drew this from. Go back to Exodus, the second book in the Old Testament and the twenty-fourth chapter, one of the most interesting events between God and His ancient people Israel. Moses, you know, has been given the law, right? And it's laid out in the twentieth chapter. And he brings it before the people and he starts unfolding what it is that God wants them to do. He lays out the law of God. 
Verse 3, Moses came, recounted to the people all the words of the Lord, all the ordinances, and all the people answered with one voice and said, all the words which the Lord has spoken we will do. Now that is an oath of obedience. That is a pledge made to God. That, that in a sense is a covenant. The people say, all the words which the Lord...